Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. Rates. The Fed is back to its rate cutting self again. In fact, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell has announced that the Fed will start to grow its balance sheet once again. Do you expect interest rates to be cut back to, to zero again anytime soon? Well, I think interest rates are on a clear trajectory and that's lower. Um, you know, I think we can probably get back very close to zero. But I don't believe interest rates in America are going to go negative. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I've been hearing that as well. Um, recently spoke to uh, Danielle DiMartino Booth, and um, she's she's holding back. She's she's not uh, ready to to say you know it's going into negative territory. So I think we're starting to see more people come out and say exactly uh, what you said. Um, but before QE ever started, the Fed's balance sheet was at about nine hundred billion. After the three rounds of QE, the Fed's balance sheet ballooned up to a high of about four and a half trillion. Of course, we know that since last year, the Fed tried to uh, bring it back down, unwind a bit. They were about at three point eight billion. Do you think it's still possible for the Fed's balance sheet to normalize back to pre QE levels, or have we permanently said goodbye to the nine hundred billion dollar level? In my, in my view, the notion that the Fed could ever return to a $900 billion uh, balance sheet is, is a pipe dream. You see, I have a big problem with anybody who, who tries to have a, a, an academic or, or, or a realistic discussion about monetary aggregates, okay? You know, I, I've listened to interviews of, of different people who are, who are somewhat respected in the alternative community making statements uh, to the effect that um, uh, monetary aggregates are basically whatever is uh, outlined or defined by the St. Louis Fed, who is the keeper of monetary aggregates for the Federal Reserve System. And they say that there's X amount of money in circulation or there's X amount of money in existence. And, and some people make claims that the Fed has been reducing the money supply over the last year or year and a half. And frankly, I say hogwash to all of that. People, people also make, make statements that the Fed, you know, is on and off at different times with, with QE, quantitative easing. And I say hogwash to all that too. You see, there, to me, there's an overarching issue that nobody, nobody wants to talk about and nobody wants to address in a serious manner, except for the people that have done the work and done the investigation into it. And, and what I'm referencing here is missing 21 trillion yes. that's, been, that's been identified and documented by the likes of Catherine Austin Fitz and Professor Mark Skidmore of Michigan State University, a PhD economist, an expert in, in public finance, and his PhD staff, uh, PhD student staff, who've, who've documented that over the period 1998 to 2015, uh, $21 trillion went through the books of either HUD or Department of Defense, DOD, and uh, th this money appeared on their balance sheets and then disappeared, and nobody knows or can explain where the money has gone. And, and this, this money is explained away as... Uh, um, uh, they have a they have a, a technical name for it. Uh, the, you know it's uh, basically it's unaccounted unaccounted for money or irreconcilable uh, uh, balance sheet adjustments uh, and and to me this this is completely and utterly rubbish because the reality is this money was there and it did disappear and 
I, I don't buy into the to the saying of some that, that, oh, that's not real money. Of course it was real money. It was real money that was created fictionally out of thin air, and, and it's disappeared. And it's I, I call it the rainy day fund. It's dark money, very likely being housed in the exchange stabilization fund, the secretive adjunct to the U.S. Treasury. Because, you see, in my world, I see evidence of untold amounts of money being put to work to create things that aren't like are counterintuitive to what should be happening. I mean, we live in a world where precious metals prices are absolutely ridiculously manipulated. We live in a world where the bond market is is dystopic and, and delusional. And you know, the, the whole notion that America being the biggest being the biggest debtor on the planet has never had a failed bond auction in the history of their auctions is absolutely unbelievable. And this, that's coming from somebody who spent 15 years professionally working in the bond markets. Like, there's just no way. Everybody, everybody who issues debt in the world, except America, has experienced a failed bond auction at one time or another. I know that, you know, having worked in the Canadian bond market uh, and being aware of, and I worked in the U.S. bond market as well, but I mean, I'm aware of other countries that issue debt, whether it's Germany, who was, who's a better credit than America. I mean, these are, these are entities that have all, at one time or another, had you know, either an abandoned auction or a failed bond auction. So, like, but, but, it never, but never in America. Absolutely never in America can't happen, right? Because the dollar's strong. And, and, and everyone, everyone loves the dollar. Well, you see, it seems to me, uh, Patrick, that in the last few years, we've seen countries go from, uh, like, you get, let's get into some crude oil issues. I mean, I mean, Russia stopped selling their oil for dollars. Okay, that's a fact. Uh, Iran doesn't sell oil for dollars. That's a fact. We know that Libya, when they stopped selling oil for dollars, uh, they got invaded. When, when Iraq stopped selling oil for dollars, they, they got invaded too. Uh, Venezuela is, you know, probably in danger of being invaded because they, they also are selling oil for other than dollars. So, you know, what did I just name there? Five countries that stopped selling oil for dollars. This is all relatively recent phenomena. Okay, well, the money that used to go, go into buying the oil for dollars, those dollars haven't disappeared, okay? So, so in, my, intu my intuitive response would be that there should be a glut of dollars. There should be a glut of dollars because all these dollars that formerly bought oil are no longer buying oil. So where do the dollars go? We're told that there isn't enough dollars in the world, you see, and, and the only way that I can reconcile that, is because there should be a glut, but there isn't. Well, lo and behold, in the last four or five years, since 2015, America's ramped up their oil production to 19, uh, sorry, to 12 and a half million barrels a day, record high production for America. So they've strapped on a good four or five million barrels of output per day uh, in the last four and a half years. And I mean, why, why did, it, and the other thing about these, these incremental barrels that have been created in the last four or five years, they're all coming from shale, yeah. shale oil, shale energy. And I mean, the break-evens on shale natural gas, for instance, are all in excess, depending on the field, their break-even prices they need to make a, make a penny range anywhere from low $3 up to mid-4s. And, you know, the price of natural gas is trading at $2.30. So they're losing money on every unit of natural gas they produce, and they're losing virtually uh, money on virtually every barrel of crude oil they produce through shale because the break-evens on, on crude oil from shale are in the high 50s at, at best. And we got, we got prices in the low 50s. So, you know, who's, who's underwriting this, okay? Yeah. How is it that this can be a growth industry that loses money? I mean, norm, normally 
intuitively, one would one would think that when 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 an industries are losing hemorrhaging cash, they would curtail operations or or cease operations. But that that doesn't apply to energy. And so and then I say to myself, well, who's underwriting it? You see, and that's where that's where I believe the strategic. I'm going to call it the strategery of stealing 21 trillion dollars and putting it in a rainy day fund. It allows you to do things like create an entity that would soak up unwanted dollars. Producing energy on the part of America is is creating something that will basically soak up the dollars that other countries used to have to buy or, or, or dollars that used to purchase, call it Russian, Iranian, or Venezuelan crude. So at the end of the day, there, there, there are absolutely dark forces at work throughout our capital markets, whether it's in the equity complex, whether it's in the bond complex, whether it's in the energy complex, or whether it's in the precious metals complex. I see dark forces and dark hands at work everywhere. And the maintenance of all of these, uh, let's just, uh, in my view, flat out fraudulent regimes, the maintenance of them all is not a cheap thing to manage. It's a very expensive undertaking to make sure that bond auctions never fail. It's a very expensive thing to hold the price of paper metal down when the physical market is on fire. It's, it's so where, you know, this, this screams uh, at the notion that there is indeed a massive amount of money that, that's, that's sequestered somewhere that's being put to work on an as need basis. And, you know, and this to me is the story of the missing 21 trillion and it, and it's being deployed on a very strategic basis, on an as-need basis, to make the dollar look strong. When, when five major oil-producing countries uh, s stop selling their, their oil for dollars, how do you describe that other than dollar rejection? Yeah. How, how do you describe that other than to say people don't want dollars and people don't want American debt? And this is why the Federal Reserve has had to step in and be the buyer of last resort of American debt. People will buy American barrels of oil in dollars when America produces extra, and, and, and they're producing them at a loss. But, but that's fungible. People will buy that because it has utility. But people do not want their American debt anymore. They don't want it. And that's why the Fed's, uh, you know, creating the money to, to buy the debt, because the, the banks, the banks have this stuff on their balance sheet, the banks, the dealers, the hedge funds, and they can't move it because there are no buyers, because because America's tapped, tapped out the rest of the world in terms of how much dollars they're willing to take. So there's a big problem in the world because dollar rejection is, is occurring and and I would argue it's accelerating as as we move along the timeline. Yeah, um totally agree. I, I know in um Europe I, I believe there's uh <clears throat> eight more countries in the EU that have joined the SWIFT alternative, which is Instex, I N S T E X, and it's further fueling the de dollarization narrative that's that's growing just as, as you're saying. Um do, do you agree that perhaps part of this also is because the, the U.S. has turned the dollar into a, a weapon to coerce other countries into following its foreign policies? Well, yeah, I mean, there's there's that aspect to to being an impetus for, for dollar rejection. But, you know, Patrick, I, I view it a little more simply. It's like. When when Skidmore, uh, when Dr. Skidmore and Catherine Fitz uh, published their findings about the missing 21 trillion, they they questioned the White House about this, and 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 the, and the Department of Defense got very very defensive, and and they tried to basically kill the links because Skidmore and Fitz they linked back to the government's own raw data, uh, in the part in, in the case of the Department of Defense. To show that their work was, you know, based on real government uh, data, 
And so the first thing the DOD did is they, they killed the links to the, to the real data, the government data. And they thought they could make, by making it disappear, they could make the problem go away. Well, when, when defense did that, the White House freaked and said, you can't do that. You, you know, you've got to put the links back up. And they did. So, so then what do we, what do we get then? We got the White House ordering a full audit of Department of Defense for the first time in history. They failed the audit miserably. And so the response to the Department of Defense failing the audit is that they, they brought in a new piece of financial regulation called FASB 56. And, and the upshot of the introduction of FASB 56 was that it, it, it gave the U.S. federal government an excuse to not publish financial, uh, accurate financial statements. So, so in, in effect, the federal government in America has been excused from accounting when they were asked fundamental questions about how much money there was. Okay, and this is why dollar rejection is where it is, and this is why it's accelerating. Because if I'm a Chinese uh, bureaucrat, or if I'm a German bureaucrat, or a Japanese bureaucrat, and I'm settling all of my international trade accounts in U.S. dollars, and the people who issue U.S. dollars won't answer fundamental questions about how many dollars there are, why am I going to continue settling my accounts in that currency? Only a lunatic would do that. So, I mean, th this, this, is, this is outrageous, and, and this, is what, this is what the world's having stuffed down its throat. And, and the world's just saying, you know what? Fine, we'll, we'll, we'll develop our own payment system, and we'll deal in other currencies. Yeah. Or we will find an alternative that's more honest than, than the way America has absolutely demonstrated that they're crooked. They're, 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 they're cheating the world. With their, with their currency. And you know what? The rest of the world is galvanizing against this. And they're saying, no more. So dollar, dollar repudiation will continue. And it will accelerate. And it will heighten. And there will come... There will come uh, I, there's some people in the Western world refer to, uh, if you've ever heard the term, a wily e. coyote moment. And that's, that's from, from cartoon lore... When the when the roadrunner and and the coyote are racing around uh, on these on these narrow roads up up on cliffs, and while the coyote runs off the cliff, he doesn't can't make the turn, and he runs off the cliff, and for a minute he he remains suspended and you know uh, way 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 up high, and then he pulls out his umbrella and he says yikes, and, and down he goes. I believe the dollar is going to have a wily e. coyote moment because the dollar is held up by basically the, the basically it's the military threat of America. That's what is keeping the dollar where it is today. But you know what? The rest of the world isn't going, isn't going to stand for America bullying them to take the dollar forever. So, you know, that only that only lasts for so long. And the biggest bully on the block is the biggest bully until a bigger bully comes along or until people get sick of the antics. And then, and then things change. And they can change very quickly once they turn. Yeah. Um, I, I tell you what, talking about that, that Wiley Coyote, things were much simpler then when we could just wake up Saturday morning and watch cartoons all day long. But, um, you know, you all of this pretty much seems to be tied into to the petrol dollar it's a deal that's about 45 years old getting close to 50 years old it was a deal made when the u.s was the biggest oil consumer saudi arabia the biggest oil producer but it, it's the deal is outdated and um you know do you think this this petrol dollar will it end peacefully will it be renegotiated or are we headed into some dire times ahead I think I think conflict is in the future because the the the, peop, the people or let's just say the stewards of the American dollar uh, are not going to give up their their position of power uh, easily, and so no, this won't be an easy transition. I mean, 
when 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 you consider consider this, we we are told, or in the in the mainstream media, and I, I actually had subscribers question me about this in the last two or three weeks. They they say that America has achieved energy independence. I mean, you hear that buzz in 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 the markets like recently that, and 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 America has not achieved energy independence at all. America consumes 20 million barrels of oil a day, and they produce 12 and a half million. So, when when you're when you're consuming 20 million, and and you're producing 12 and a half million, you you are not energy independent. Okay, I mean, but what what has happened is they've conflated the notion that America doesn't rely on Middle Eastern oil anymore. But, it, I mean, America's taking in over 4 million barrels a day from Canada. And America's taken in, I believe, it's close to a couple million barrels a day from Mexico. And But I, the amount of Middle Eastern oil that they require now is, is basically down to zero. So, and, 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 but, I mean, that's not energy independence. Unless, unless you consider Canadian oil really just American oil, but with a different flag flying over it for some reason. But I mean, and, 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 and me can only wonder what would happen if Canada decided to sell some of its oil for euros or a different currency. I think, I think we, would become very, uh, we would become very unpopular very quickly. So not to say that that's what Canada should do, I mean, our biggest trading partner is America, and but I mean, I'm I'm just raising the question, um, you know, what gives the dollar its sustenance is crude oil, and when when barrels when when big amounts of barrels are no longer priced in dollars, it creates problems for the dollars, unless you can create a new home for those dollars, because like Amer like if if you've noticed, America's deficits aren't getting smaller; they're getting bigger. And, and they're running at plus a trillion dollars a year. Yeah. So. Okay. So, I mean, um, I guess given that you are expecting a, a weaker dollar in, in the future, as it's, it's probably happening now, we just haven't really seen it yet. Do you expect we're, we're going to see gold prices start to, to spike? Um, you know, that's a good question. Gold prices should be, in my at least in my view, Patrick, gold prices should be multiples of what they are today, right now, and they're not. And so why so why is that happening? And, and uh, the only thing I can say to that is that uh, American regulators have laws on the books, like the, there's commodities law that states basically that what has happened in the gold market and the silver market should never ever be allowed to happen under law. But law isn't, 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 uh, you know, followed. And we have regulators in America at the CFTC, Commodities Futures Trading Commission, who don't regulate. Okay? So, speculating about when or if or at, to what extent the price of gold or silver will go up is really a question about when will American regulators start regulating? So, and, and personally, Right now, I don't see any impetus or any inclination of American regulators to regulate because they refuse to regulate. There's, you know, there, there's in commodities law they have it. They have laws that state that you know issues of concentration, uh, you know, are 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 basically outlawed. But you know, in, in the in the gold market, people can sell in paper form. Uh, in one day on an exchange like COMEX, they can sell the equivalent of all the gold that gets mined out of the Earth's crust in a year. They can sell that in six hours. This is gold that doesn't exist. It's not for sale anywhere in physical form, but people are allowed to sell it in paper form or digital form, like in, in unending amounts. Same thing in silver, even worse. And I mean, this is completely and utterly ridiculous. And, and, and there's laws stating that it shouldn't be happening. But when you've got regulators that don't regulate, it's sort of like, you know, when, when you've got laws against, you know, let's say you can't murder anyone, but you've got a sheriff that, you know, 
you've got a sheriff who doesn't own a gun and and has and has no interest uh, you know and he doesn't have a car to catch anyone and and it's like and he's looking the other way and he doesn't want to hear about anyone being being murdered so you end up you end up with you know in in the case of you know the sheriff who who doesn't do his job you end up with a lawless you know a lawless society well you know in our capital markets you know it's become it's become lawless and what we have is we have the biggest bully on the block wins and the biggest bully on the block basically is the exchange stabilization fund and the US treasury which which do the price setting in the precious precious metals markets and and they also intervene covertly i would say uh, or, or i would suggest they intervene covertly to to basically bid up us bonds and, and ensure that bond auctions never fail yeah you know Quite rob simple. okay rob you know in um <clears throat> in your neck of the woods um and i know you you deal with the uh, the very wealthy um, from time to time, well, what are you hearing from them? What what are they doing? What are they seeing? Well, ev everybody knows there's something wrong, okay. And you know, even if they can't put their finger on what it is that's wrong, but people people express openly that things aren't right and that things are dystopic. And I mean, for the most part, people just hope hope they're going to muddle their way through. And, you know, a lot of people who have who have means in today's terms, in, in terms of fiat money, um, a lot of them assume that their fiat money will, will protect them as long as they have enough of it. And, you know, in, in, in my view, I look at what, what has occurred in recent years in countries like Venezuela. Venezuela used to be one of the wealthiest countries on the planet. Argentina is another country that used to be one of the wealthiest nations on the planet. And I mean, their economies through the ravages of hyperinflation or the debasement of their currencies, uh, you know, the very wealthy became paupers very quickly. And this is what can happen when people lose faith in fiat money. And in my view, we have an unfolding what will be a major recognized as a major major crisis globally uh, with dollar rejection uh, underway and accelerating and I mean you know most of humanity is is Wiley coyote chasing the roadrunner and you know they're gonna reach a point where they they think they can make a, a hairpin turn and, and they're not going to make the turn, and their fiat isn't going to keep them suspended in thin air when, when they go over the cliff. But, I mean, you know, look, there are Fed governors through the years. I think it was uh, uh, Fisher was the head of the Dallas Fed yeah. who, who back 10 or 12 years ago spoke about the dollar. In like We, we got a couple of glimpses of candor from a, from a central banker when he stated that the dollar is a game of confidence and you know we're going to do everything in our power to keep people believing in the dollar and you know we basically saying we have to get that right well i mean this is what this is what they're doing and the way they get us to keep believing in the dollar and make us believe that the dollar's strong and that the dollar's scarce is they create artificial scarcity, okay? When people are getting rid of their dollars and don't want dollars in trade, mm -hmm. they have to make them look look like they're scarce and unavailable. And how do you do that? Well, well in, in the case of America, they ramped up their oil output by an extra four or five million barrels a day. And that has, has a way of soaking up excess dollars that are in the system and making them look scarce. If if the dollar wasn't being rejected, countries would be would be wanting to sell their crude oil for dollars, but they're not. They're selling them for any currency but dollars, in 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 a, in a great many cases. And I mean, is is it any look? And if the dollar was strong, wouldn't people be buying U.S. government debt? Would the Federal Reserve really need to be buying or or, or doing repos on that debt on a daily basis? 
to give that debt a home and to make it liquid? The reality is the rest of the world doesn't want dollar-denominated debt anymore. Okay, and that, we're witnessing it. We're seeing it happen on a daily basis. How can you how can you explain what's going on in the repo market other than dollar? Uh, you know, it's 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 dollar rejection, plain and simple. Okay, yeah, you know that that's um <clears throat> very concerning because if and I, I've kind of said something along the lines like this before, where if on one side of the Atlantic, you know, dollars are coming back home, and then on this side of the Atlantic, we're printing more. Are we staring at hyperinflation? Well, you know, Patrick, I would argue that technically we probably should be there now. But if America hadn't, you see, the dollars are coming home, except right now those dollars are going into uh, into basically purchasing oil that's being produced at a loss. And effectively, the dollars are coming home and they're disappearing into a black hole. And that way, they're not inflationary because there's no there's no profit being made on any of this. But. But but the energy priced in dollars, uh, you know, people will buy it because it, it has utility. And so, so that's occurring. Um, but you see, if America wasn't producing the extra four or five million barrels a day, those dollars would still be coming home and they'd be looking for something else to purchase that hopefully has some utility. And, you know, we... You know, without without the increase, massive increase in American oil production, we very likely would be experiencing something approaching a hyperinflation now. Anyway, all I'm saying is that as as the dollars continue to return home to America, they're either they're either dealt dealt with in in in, in some fashion to to make the dollar look like it's still wanted. Or, or, or they pile up, and the confidence is broken in the currency, and in which case, then everybody starts spending dollars trying to buy something of value all at once, and that's called hyperinflation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Rob, last question. Um, we're seeing the signs of de-dollarization already happening, and the decline of the U.S. empire all point to a new monetary system. You think gold is going to have a role in the next? monetary system i i believe it will uh and and that's why you need to own it now even though even though it's being suppressed in the in the digital and paper markets ownership of physical metal when the confidence finally breaks to me it will be like a a a dam bursting and when the dam bursts you you either will own physical metal or you won't get any, plain and simple. And ownership of paper proxies for physical metal are not going to get you physical metal when the dam breaks. And, and, and to me, it's only a matter of time, not a matter of if uh, the dam breaks and the confidence breaks in the currency. So you, you, you've got to be positioned before it breaks, and it will. So, uh, and I, I maintain that forever. Okay, yeah, I hear you, Rob. Totally, totally agree. I think um, you've cleared things up so much that it brought upon more questions for, for us that we're going to have to hold the people in power, too. But before we wrap up, Rob, can you let our listeners know more about your work over at uh, Kirby Analytics? Well, I, I mean, I do proprietary forensic macroeconomic research, and I I publish my findings when I feel I have something to offer, and I do a fair amount of media. And you can catch me on the web at kirbyanalytics.com. Rob Kirby, we, we thank you for coming on the show. It's...